morning, we have two passages, and basically, for the background, I simply ask you to listen carefully to the passages. You'll hear some things that are similar. You'll hear some things that are different. Uh, basically, two different people are asking Jesus the same question. Hear now the reading from Luke. The first reading is from the uh, 10th chapter, Luke, verses 25 through 29. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? The second reading is also from Luke, and it's chapter 18, verses 18 through 23. A certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. He replied, I've kept all of these since my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, there's still one thing lacking, sell all that you own and distribute the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. But when he heard this, he became sad for he was very rich. Throughout Lent, we are in a series of sermons under the title, How the Grace Thing Works. It's taken from a Mumford and Son song, and One Voice has done it very well in adapting that to this theme for these weeks. If you've missed one of the, the sermons in this series that is dealing essentially with how do you respond to the invitation to new life? How do you respond to grace? I'd invite you to call up our webpage and check the sermon uh, resources or the files for, for old sermons that you've missed. I think you'll see this strong theme of uh, how we can work in Lent in our souls in such a way to celebrate truly new life. And today we're going to do uh, a very simple thing, explore a very simple command, if you will, together. But maybe even before we leave, this simple opportunity we have may very well change our lives. Let us pray. Lord God, as you moved in this service, would you please move your spirit and the words about to be spoken and heard into that which will be thought and felt, so that in all ways we honor the living Christ in our midst. Amen. Some comedians like uh, Stephen Wright and the late Mitch Hedberg have made a living out of what's called observational comedy. They will observe certain things that we take for granted, and they'll simply make us think about them in different ways. For example, listen to this. Why does a round pizza come in a square box? Or, why do you park on driveways and drive on parkways? Why don't you ever see the headline, Psychic Wins Lottery? Why doesn't Tarzan have a beard? Why doesn't Tarzan have a beard? Haven't you ever wondered that? Why is it called lipstick if you can still move your lips? Why is it that night falls but day breaks? Why is the third hand on the watch called a second hand? Why do people who know the least know it the loudest? That's my favorite. Do I hear an amen on that last one? Amen. You see, questions, a good question will make you think of things, make you re-examine things that you've taken for granted. Maybe you get a new insight, a new direction, whatever. And it strikes me that as Christians, we have a duty, especially in Lent, this time of self-examination, 
to ask ourselves the right questions, questions that will help us see things, maybe ourselves, in a different way. Maybe some of you have heard of Elie Wiesel, who was the, uh, known as a Nazi hunter after a war, he hunted down Nazi war criminals. But in his autobiography, he says something very interesting. As a kid growing up in a village in Hungary, he attended a synagogue where there was an older man named Moshe who uh, cleaned up after the services were over. And they began talking one day, and Moshe gave his philosophy on life. Every question possesses a power that does not lie in the answer. Humans raise themselves to God by the questions they ask. In other words, humans approach God by the asking the correct questions. And Ali went on and said, well, well, Moshe, how do you pray? Why do you pray? And he responded, I pray that God will give me the strength to ask him the right questions. The right questions questions. The right questions are those that help you dig deeper into life and get more out of it. They help you uh, pursue life with passion, a passion that's long left, uh, left you dry and barren when you have not dared ask those questions. I think you can, as you see on the screen, uh, take this as your command for today. What is the most important question I need to ask right now? I know there was a, a, I guess as you change, as you go from childhood to youth to young adulthood, all throughout your life to the very end, there are different questions that can move you. Like there was one businessman who was quite successful, and at the pinnacle of the business he created, just as it was uh, really about to bloom, he sold it off. He went to seminary, became a pastor, and he explained his decision this way. Not to be into something, that is, not to be seeking an answer to a perplexing, life-changing question, is to be in despair. I like that. Paul put it, forgetting what lies behind, I keep pressing ahead, because you can never be comfortable as a Christian. You can't be. The second you think, oh, I'm saved, or oh, I know what I need to know, or I feel secure in life, that is when you cease becoming the disciple that Christ asked. Because Christ never said, come, follow me and sit. But no, come, follow me along all the bends and the curves of the road that I'll lead you down. And so this morning, I would simply ask you in the questions that I will pose to you, to pick one or to create your own. We have on the bulletin a place under the scripture heading in the back that you can write questions, if you will. I invite you to do so. But when you leave, by the time you leave, at least come up with one question that's going to nudge you. And it could be a type of question that encourages you to look inward. That's one classification, if you would. The right question might ask you, for example, to ask yourself, what are my real priorities? And you can come up with an answer for that by asking or examining, how am I spending my time? At the end of the day, do you look back, ever reflect on how did you spend the time today? Did you spend it most concerned about why Kanye West and Kim Kardashian are on the cover of Vogue? Or did you spend it in a little more of a enriching fashion with family or with friends or alone with God. How you spent your time tells you how you should answer that question, what are my real priorities? How did you spend your money today or for the week or for the month or for the year? And if you were to look back and take an inventory of how much you made and how much you spent in these categories, well, it would too tell you what your priorities are. Did you spend it mostly on yourself or on your own for whipped cream type stuff? Did you even know how much of your income that you devoted back to God to say thanks? It's a question that can push you and prod you. Here's another right question, possibly for you. What are my values? And you decide on that by asking, 
how did I make my decisions? How did I judge my decisions? Uh, uh, what, how did I make them? Like, did I, did I make my decision based on how popular I would be? Did I make my decision on the profit principle? Or did I make my decision on what is uh, just or what is compassionate or what is grace-filled? How did you make your decision? What are your values? And another right question that makes you look inside perhaps is, what's my personality? Have you ever done something, been with a group of people, and suddenly you say something or you do something and you ask yourself, why did I just, why did I do that? It's like there's this other person living inside you and you, for the first time, got a perspective saying, that's not me. Like one voice saying, who am I? You might discover parts of your personality you were never aware of, but you took time to ask the question, what is my, why do I do and say the things I do and say? So those are examples of one type of question, the kind that makes you look inside. Here's another type, the outside one. What's God calling me to do? If you haven't heard the theme of what we've been at for the last few weeks of Lent with Sir 440 or with uh, all these other opportunities, then I don't know where you've been because <laughs> this is the key. What's God calling me to do? Or you could add to that, who needs my help right now? Or it might be, where can I make a difference? Or it might be, how can an injustice that I see at office or at school, even at home, be corrected? Do you see how easy it is never to ask those questions? Do you see how important it is to ask, to start? So like I said, I really hope before you leave this place, some of those questions might hit home, might have prompted a new one to, to spring out of your soul. I don't know. So I would hope you would come out with one. However, I want you to also hear the second part of the sermon, which starts now. Second part of the sermon deals with the moral of the two stories that you heard Joe read to you. Two men asked Jesus the same question. One is a lawyer. He asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus answers, love God, love your neighbor. The lawyer, being a lawyer, says, well, give me the definition of neighbor. And at that point, Jesus goes into the Good Samaritan. That's the rest of that passage in Luke. Then there is a man who's called a ruler. Other gospel uh, tellings of this story call him a, a young man who had some authority. He asked the same question. Jesus says, keep the commandments. Young man says, ooh, I've done that. Do I get eternal life? Nope, one more thing you need to do. Sell everything, give to the poor, follow me. And the young man goes away sad, the Bible says. Two men, same question, different answers, same response. They pull back and they ignore, they walk away from Jesus. The moral of that, those two stories, if you ask the right question, you better be sure that you want to hear the answer. You got that? It's not enough to ask the question. You have to have the courage, the guts, to be willing to do what it takes to receive the answer. In the United Methodist Church, elders take the vow of what's called itineracy. That means that often in the spring of the year, you might get a call from the bishop or the district superintendent saying, we've decided that your gifts and graces would best be suited at this church over wherever. Hey, Ty or Hannibal, Joplin or St. Joe, anywhere. And that is when you have to decide, is this really my calling? You know what I mean? It's a sacrifice. You have to really consider whether you, having asked the question, where do you want me to serve, have to deal with the answer. Yeah, over there. And you pick up your family and you move. Well, I want to suggest to you today that every one of us here is in the itinerant system. 
which means every one of us here, if you're a Christian, every one of us has taken the vow that we will go where you want us to go, Lord, in service to you. Note that when you ask, where do you want me to go? You have to be willing to accept the answer and make the sacrifice to go there. And it might really mean that after you ask yourself, what kind of a life am I living, that you might need to go back to school or change schools or change jobs. It might be when you ask yourself the right question, and that question is, uh, how am I spending my my time, that you, you pass up a promotion so that you can spend more time with your family or in service to God. It might mean that when you ask, how am I spending my money? How am I glorifying God by giving back to God what God's given me? It might be that you take that Financial Peace University class. You get out of debt, and with joy, you give back to God as a way of saying thanks for all that you have. You ask the right question, then the sacrifice might be that you have to uh, get involved in the messy lives of someone, maybe an addict. Or it might be that when you ask the right question, you have to get involved in the messiness of your own personality and you seek out counsel or spiritual guidance. Get the idea? Ask that question, but then follow through on the answer that you hear. It's not easy. But whoever said being a Christian is easy? Remember, as we've said time and again, we are not a congregation of consumers. We are a community of disciples. That means we always know that the life that is awaiting us ahead of us is freer than the dead parts of of our lives that are confining us now. Ask the question and live into the answer. Now, if you've heard me preach a while, you know that I really like to try to leave you with something that you can sort of hang your hat on, and maybe for the rest of the week, you go, oh yeah, yeah, that's what what I remember from Sunday's service. And so I ask myself, at this very point of the sermon, as I'm leading toward a close, I ask, is there some person who really exemplifies the power of asking the right question and then living into the answer. And the man who instantly came to my mind was this guy, Steve Jobs. Mr. Jobs, as you well know, started Apple, but it didn't, the apple just didn't fall from the tree. (laughs) I made that up. (laughs) Okay. He started Apple Computer, but he started with a question. In the infancy of personal uh, computing, He said, there has to be some better way than simply typing DOS commands on an amber screen. And so he came up with the graphical user interface, which is called the Apple computer, the original one. But he didn't stop there. He continued asking questions. He said, is there a way that I could make a device that's small, simple to use, that could store thousands of tunes that people have to buy for me. Is there a way to do that? He came up with the iPod, but he didn't stop there. He kept asking questions. So he asked, is there a way to take the phone and make it something other than what you talk into, to make it a powerful computer? And as you see, the iPhone came to be, but he didn't stop there. He continued thinking, hmm, is there a way that I could make a portable computer that could connect to the net, could download books and tunes, and could run powerful applications, and could I make this computer no bigger than a sheet of paper? And the iPad came to be. Our world has changed all because Mr. Steve Jobs continued throughout his life asking questions. And if you read his biography, you will note that the reason he kept asking questions was that he had a purpose. His purpose, I want to make a dent in the universe. 
I submit to you that every one of us here has that same purpose in the name of Christ. Before we die, we have to make a dent in our personal universe. Before we die, we have to make sure that our life was worth something. Before we die, we have to live in such a way, we have to ask the questions in such a way that the answers that we live into will profoundly affect someone's life in the name of the one who profoundly affected our lives, Jesus the Christ. Your purpose is out there, and the fun of life is asking the right questions so that you can live into those answers and make a dent in the universe. My friends, that's simply how the grace thing works. Amen.